that's your countdown. Welcome everyone to our Valentine's edition of Virtual Vino. Today is, is obviously going to be wines we recommend for Valentine's Day, so they're pretty special wines. And uh, we're also going to be talking a little bit about food, specifically charcuterie. And uh, I think it's going to be a really great show, so I'm glad everyone is joining us. Um, during today's show, please do not hesitate to comment questions, send emojis, and of course, like and share if you see fit. Uh, all of these things help us with the algorithms apparently on Facebook. So thank you very much if you do that. Uh, hopefully you were able to find these four wines in one of the stores that had, had them. And uh, also they hopefully came in our blue virtual vino bag along with the tasting sheet. We also have wines that have been featured previously in Virtual Vino, and you can easily identify those wines by the neckers we put on them in the liquor stores, as you can see in the picture. Before we get to today's guests and, uh, and the wines, I'd like to let everyone know which wines we will be featuring in two weeks. The uh, Paxis Red Blend from Portugal, it received 89 points from Wine Enthusiast Magazine and, and is definitely our most popular selling wine. Um, the Panama Red Blend as well, which received 90 points from Wine Enthusiast Magazine and was number 22 in their top 100 best buys of 2019. It was also rated excellent and great value by the Washington Post. The Lab Vino Verde, the Lab Vino Verde Rosé, which was also rated excellent and great value by the Washington Post. All four wines are from Portugal and they demonstrate what an incredible value Portuguese wines have become. These four wines, along with our wine bag and tasting sheet, will be available in DC at Paul's of Cherry Chase and in Maryland at Bradley Food and Beverage in Bethesda, Woodmore Market and Prime Beer and Wine in Silver Spring and also in Riverdale at Town Center Market. Please check out our Facebook page to find additional stores that will be carrying the wines. This year we're doing Virtual Vino a little differently. Virtual Vino will occur every other Thursday at 7 p.m. Typically we will have local guests once a month and on the other date, we will host winemakers, winery owners, and importers. This week, we are doing both, as we will be joined by Peter Ulichianski. He's the, the Mid-Atlantic Regional Manager for Tribe and Imports, and we're going to sample four of the wines that he recommends for Valentine's Day. Uh, the Cavalli Rosé Prosecco, which was actually in the Washington Post yesterday. It was recommended for Valentine's Day. The Amore Red Blend, which was recommended last year by the Washington Post for Valentine's Day. Uh, Massatino Brut Prosecco, which received 96 points from the Cantor Magazine. And also the Guru Gold, which received 93 points from Wine Spectator. So we've got four wonderful wines tonight. Um, we're also going to be joined by Stephanie David a DC-based blogger who is on Instagram as Cheers and Choose. Stephanie will demonstrate how to build a charcuterie board for two, showing some tips and tricks to give it a Valentine's Day theme. And we will, and of course she will educate us on which items on her board pair best with today's wines. Please don't hesitate again to share your thoughts on the wines and the charcuterie in the comments section and feel free to ask questions as well. It is also possible to join us on screen and ask questions live if you like. Uh, Jess will put up the link to the, in the comments section during the wine tasting. So you can just click on it and you'll pop up in our green room and then Jess will admit you to join us in our quote unquote studio. So to get us started, let me introduce Stephanie. There she is. Thank you so much for joining us, Stephanie. And Thank if you, you could just tell us a little bit about your background and, of course, charcuterie. 
Yes. So my background is I am from the D.C. area, um, live and work in Arlington, D.C., and I have had the Cheers and Choose account on Instagram going for the last about a year and a half um, where I just love hosting when you can, <clears throat> obviously not as much these days, um, and love making charcuterie boards and drinking wine and giving going to the wineries and all of that. So it just kind of started from there. And now I just pair wines with cheeses, give tips and tricks and talk about all my favorite things. Awesome. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, our second guest tonight is going to be uh, Peter Ulichianski, as I mentioned earlier. He's the Mid-Atlantic Regional Manager for Tribe and Imports. And uh, hopefully Peter will be popping up here in a second. And Peter, if you can uh, tell us a little bit about your background and and then go ahead and uh, start telling us about the Massatina Prosecco as well. And folks, don't forget to share your thoughts on the wines if you have them to taste. Um, I highly recommend if you have the mini which I do tonight, open the miniature wine tonight and save the big wine for Valentine's Day. So go ahead, Peter. Absolutely, I think that's definitely a good way to do it. I've been a fan of, of the, the 187s as, as we like to call them in industry term. Um, as as, as uh, it, you don't feel as bad when you have the whole thing, but um, <clears throat> except if you maybe get a second one out, but anyway, the, um, so tell a little bit about my, my background. I've been in the wine business uh, now. Jeez, I try not to think back because it dates me a little bit, but uh, 20, well, maybe not quite 20 years yet. So, but started in a distributor, working my way up. It's really kind of the way you get to see how the market works and uh, went to work for a uh, importer uh, about 13 years ago. And so I've been down uh, based here in, in, in the Raleigh, North Carolina market. So, and, and I've had a chance to work uh, now, especially coming over here with Triven, uh, work with some of the retail partners down here in, in, in the mid-Atlantic area, uh, some of the chains, uh, chain businesses as well, uh, and then also our distributor network down here uh, as well. So stores, for example, that you might be familiar with, with such as Wegmans, uh, of course, Harris Teeter, The Fresh Market, uh, to name a few of, of some of the ones that, that uh, I work directly with. So. Uh, it's been a fun business, uh, more, more or less, uh, in that aspect. And, uh, you know, I have lots of friends that sometimes feel jealous, but, but at the same time, I tell them they, you know, don't always get to see the other side and some of the frustrations. And, and no matter what, sometimes you get frustrated. But at the same time, I still, if I need to relax, I have a glass of wine. So it's kind of ironic in that sense that uh, it could be your biggest stressor of the day. But here at the same, you're like, that's it, I need a glass of wine. So, um, so the first one, first wine we're going to have today is the Massatina, uh, which, which you see right here as, as well. And I kind of didn't open this one because we'll, we'll do a little tour of a, a good way to open it. A lot of people are intimidated of opening a sparkling bottle of wine and, and not, not sure or, or what to do with it per se. But uh, I've, I've, I've liked the Massatina. So, you know, kind of go back. I've had, uh, you know, joined Triben last year. So I'm coming up on my year anniversary. And and so it was is the fun part of it was is to kind of get educated real quickly. I had to go through a lot of samples and perfect timing that I have to be COVID because what else can I do? Just order samples and we'll try something else every day. So uh, uh, it, one of the first sparklings I had was his Massatina. And I was I was thoroughly impressed because, uh, it, you know, I was like, how does a, a, a 96 rating? I'm like, OK, this this got to be something about that. But. It, uh, it it truly is outstanding for for what you get and the value that it has. So, but the winery is it's a it's a family winery that uh, you know was was established back in in, in 1946, and so <clears throat> and 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 the whole thing it was founded by a, a gentleman. Uh, his name is Epifiano. I've had to look at that multiple times. Epifiano Dal Bianco. So, and now it's third generation ones runs the winery now, but you know, their whole philosophy is, is kind of getting to know the terroir and, and applying that to, to essentially make the best product that uh, is, is available as well. So uh, I guess a good way to put it is precision viticulture is a term that they like to use uh, for, for, for their wines itself. And so uh, I'm sure most people are familiar with Prosecco by, by this particular point, the grape, is 100% uh, Glera is specifically the name of the grape that uh, is is contained in that. And 
this particular Masotina is is a is a brute. So it'll it'll be the least uh, most commonly the least uh, dry. Uh, excuse me, not the most dry, but the least amount of residual sugar in it contains. So and, and I know a lot of times between extra dry, people think, well, you know, extra dry should be drier than brute, but it, it is what it is. That's it's it's one of those things. But um, <clears throat> so 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 when you have a chance to try it, you'll notice it, and it's and the area it comes from. Is is in the Trevisio region. So when we get a chance to put a map up, uh, essentially you'll get a chance to see kind of where that Prosecco uh, area is is up there, and uh, the, you know the Veneto region itself. Uh, so primarily that's what's grown there, and and Prosecco. I mean, it's kind of a newer n newer area or or a designated region when it's something called the DOC, and uh, uh, which which was you know probably within the last ten years that they established that. That says okay, you know, prosecco can only come from this particular area, you know, uh, and 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 since then it's really gained ground and and for its value, for what it offers, uh, it's it's called it Italy champagne is a lot of times uh, the way I like to hear about it. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and and open the one I have to 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 give everyone an, an opportunity, and and either you've either the, either opened yours up already uh, or not, but. Got a little tab, and you know, pretty much very easy to do it. Um, and the trick is, is always sometimes if if you like to use a, a towel or something of that sort, but I like to place my hand just on it as I'm undoing it, and and then I take off that tape, and then it's all again. You don't want to point it towards you or anyone else, but just soft turns like this particular aspect. And then you'll feel the cork up come up, and then you'll get that little pop. And not as intimidating as it sounds, but a little practice doesn't take too long. But you'll feel it. You'll feel the cork, a little pressure on it, and then uh, it doesn't, doesn't disappear on you. So uh, I hope everyone else is getting a chance to try it as well. So, again, uh, it's got a 96 points. Uh, as, as, uh, so it's, it's again, uh, phenomenal for, for, for what you get. And, uh, and and especially with the cheeses that we'll be having paired here shortly, uh, you'll see that it it, it could it, perfect pairing. Perfect pairing is the best way to put that. So that's great, Peter. Thank you so much. And just so everyone knows, the uh, smaller bottle, the 187, does not have a cork, so it's it's simply a twist off. If you're if you don't want to deal with uh, the cork, twist off <laughs> is very easy to deal with. So Stephanie, could, could you tell us uh, from your charcuterie board what, what you would recommend to go with the Massatina? Yeah, so I am a huge fan of goat cheese in particular. Soft creamy chevre is one of my absolute favorite go-tos, especially with sparkling and bubbly. The creamy tanginess works really well with the bubbles that cleans the palate, cleanses the palate um, from both of the Proseccos. So that is one that I will have on the board tonight and would probably be the best paired match of what we have. Um, I would also separately try out like a Parmesan Reggiano because that one, also the saltiness of that works really well. Um, so two different textures, but both work really well with Prosecco. I was at a restaurant last night, which was a rarity because uh, I can't remember the last time I was at one. And it was in this Italian place and, and they had something called uh, it was a charcuterie plate, and so I kind of got that because I'm like, okay, the best way for me to plan for today is to kind of just start indulging in what I'm going to go in right. and have. Uh, yeah. And the they they had this, they called it Parmesan gelato, and Ooh. it was quite interesting because it looked, I mean, it looked like some ice cream, and it had some some drizzle on it. And I was like, and and but it's essentially like, well, we just call it gelato because we didn't know what else to call it, but it has nothing to do with gelato or ice cream or anything, but basically they just kind of uh, took the Parmesan and, and made it into a paste. So, and it, it was just a nice little ball sitting right on top. I, I was, I was amazed on, on, on what it was like. I've never had it, but that it, sounds it, awesome. perfect spread. it was, it spread like a butter, but it was okay, Parmesan. Did you put it on like a cracker or was no, it on? Absolutely. That's all it yeah. was, but you literally looked at it. It it's had the consistency of like vanilla ice cream or something of that sort. Interesting. So, so I found that to be uh, a, a good, but I had that. I, was like, I know the I know the taste, but I had to ask for what it was because I couldn't pick it up on what it is. And I can see that it, you know the Parmesan or or something of a, 
uh, something that is Parmesan based would be would be absolutely perfect with this, yeah. which is, you know, Prosecco has really been known as an aperitif. I mean, that's one of the things that the Italians do is 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 they drink it, you know, before their meal to get to to to, to get the meal started in a way. So uh, yeah. it's much the same way with 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 the charcuterie and cheese. It's it's the oh, yeah. Well, and I definitely think like the bubbles and it almost pairs with anything, to be honest. Like I think it just yeah. always works nicely. You can't really go wrong when you're working with sparkling um, and most of cheese pairings. That's a really good point. I mean, people are finding out finally that sparkling wine can go with just about everything. I mean, it, er, historically it's been considered just a celebration toasting wine, but really right. it is an amazing food wine. And uh, people are finally figuring that out. And oh, I think yeah. you're absolutely right about the cheeses. Um, I should mention, I, I saw a bunch of people joining us from Annapolis. So that's really cool. We have a bunch of people in Annapolis and it looks like some folks in Hagerstown as well. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I think we'll taste the uh, Cavalli Prosecco Rosé next. And this was actually uh, featured in the Washington Post yesterday. It was recommended for Valentine's Day. So it, it's going to be wonderful. And Peter, if you want to tell us a little bit about it. Absolutely. I needed to finish what I have in order for me to pour the next one. And I was like, hold on, I can't, I can't mix it, but I'm a little slow. So Cavalli. And uh, two exciting things about that. Kovali is actually a brand that uh, is, is Trivin's brand. And what we kind of set out to accomplish with this brand was to, to be able to take kind of Italian wine from, from different parts of Italy, you know, pick the best places that represent exactly what that wine uh, is supposed to be. So, so it's kind of a, uh, an Italian brand, it's our own house brand. Uh, uh, as, as another way to put it. So, so I kind of like really this one, especially with uh, the Prosecco and now with just recently introduced the Prosecco Rosé. And now there's been Italian wines out there that have had the, uh, a, a pinkness to it, but it was literally not legal as far as the wine classification system for Italy to be able to call something an actual Prosecco Rosé. You just had to call it a brute cuvee or rosé cuvee or something of that sort in in that aspect and and the consortium for the different for 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 the italian classifications which is that that doc level uh it's a consortium that decided that okay i, I think you it, know it, it was god i felt, felt it's been two three years now but i mean back to 2018 we started discussing the idea of well are we going to allow uh something that's going to be actually called prosecco rosé and and it wasn't until last year that they made that that official and they decided that and usually that's what this consortium is and say, OK, well, you know, what is going to be the standard for Prosecco Rosé? So basically any winery can take the glare up and uh, blend uh, 10 to 15 percent of Pinot Nero, in, in their case, Pinot Noir, uh, as most commonly uh, said around in, in other parts of the world. And that'll give it that that pink hue. Uh, so so that was finally approved, and and now you are definitely seeing, especially now coming into 2021, uh, uh, the ability to have have prosecco rosé, and and it's uh, it's it's kind of unique. Of, of course, it, it's perfect timing for Valentine's Day because it's got that pink hue, uh, and and it, and it comes across you know, you, you know as as a great item. Uh, paired with flowers and you just name it, it goes down the path of exactly being the right out. And so it was a very good selection for today. It's new and it's exciting. Uh, and and this particular one is, it, wh why we picked it is again, because it, we wanted a Brut for one, much like the Mastatina, because uh, I actually prefer Brut because of the dryness. It's It's got uh, uh, the nice acidity and nice, nice fruit to it, but one thing that you'll get out of the rosé is you, you will introduce some of those notes of strawberry or, or some of those red, light red, red fruits into that aspect. And it gives you a little, little uh, a different experience of uh, what you can do with that. So, so I, I encourage everyone to give this now a try, uh, admire the hue that you have with it and uh, uh, definitely, definitely enjoy it. This was the first one I, I opened today because I'm like, all right, I'm gonna have to start with that before, before we have our, our virtual because it's, it's just the perfect, uh, a way to set the tone for the evening. Uh, it's a good way to put it. 
Thanks, Peter. That was really interesting. And, and actually, I wish I knew more about the uh, what, you, what you were talking about. I, I learned something today. I probably should have known previously. So that's great. And uh, there's no doubt that this, you know, this is the first year we've seen rosé proseccos, and we're seeing a lot of them. Uh, yeah, definitely. I, I to, uh, hit some grocery stores while, while I was down in Charlotte, and I was like, "Yeah, it's it's definitely here." <laughs> so it's, like it's growing in popularity all over the place. <laughs> yeah, pink, pink is definitely has, uh, and, and and I think it kind of follows the you know rosé itself for you know I guess the American consumer. Or the American market. I mean, it's it's more of a recent phenomena for for dry pink wine. I mean, uh, I, I go back to when I it was at it, it, going back to last decade. It, anytime you mentioned pink, most people would think, no, no, I'm not interested in something sweet. Uh, and and your first first example, you think, okay, if it's pink, it's got to be white zin or something of that sort. And for the longest time, that's what it was. And and so, but you know, around 2015, all of a sudden, you start seeing the trend that okay, pink could be dry. I mean. Most of the world kind of knew that in a way, and and you know outside of maybe some markets like New York, Miami, and, and that, but it wasn't uh, wasn't common. So, but I, I think over the years of how that 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 area has exploded, I mean, you can go to any market now, and rosé has a section much like Pinot Grigio or Sauv Blanc, and um, and then now with with kind of now introducing that, it's 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 actually a better way to market, of course, because people know Prosecco. I just add the rosé to it, so it, it only makes sense. Not just from a from a winery perspective or something of that sort, but obviously for for, for furthering the 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 knowledge of, of prosecco and, and the brand of prosecco for Italy. Yeah. So I see uh, Mr. Strickler has has commented on his uh, wife instituting the Sparkling Friday, and, and that's genius right there. <laughs> I like you know, this style. Yeah. Whatever they're eating, that is absolute genius. Um, so well done. And uh, also, I'm, I'm looking at the comments. I see that uh, my mom is watching, which is wonderful. So we have someone from Washington, D.C. watching and uh, a couple more people from Hagerstown. And I, I see the, the Eastern Shore is represented as well. So we're covering a lot of the D.C., Maryland area, which is great. Um, so, Stephanie, I guess I'll put you on the spot again yeah. with your charcuterie board. What, what would you pair with the uh, Cavalli Prosecco Rosé with? Yeah, so I would definitely still stick with the goat cheese that I already have. I would also suggest maybe a brie would be nice because um, this is super light in comparison to some other wines out there. And so kind of sticking in the lighter, smooth sort of cheeses I think is always a good play. And then you can start to kind of move into like your cheddars, like your young aged um, cheddars I think would work really well. But with what we have on the board tonight, goat cheese will be the main pairing here. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I agree with it because it, it's it's such a flavorful cheese and balance right. it with the acidity that 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 comes with these wines, uh, especially in a brute uh, type of a uh, uh, setting of these. It's you really it, the, the palate kind of uh, uh, like explodes in a way to me with with you get that yeah. tartness and it hits you and then the prosecco does the same thing in in, in that aspect. And so you know when you mention brie, do you find that that baked or or not baked makes a difference a little bit. i think when it's baked it becomes a little bit more savory sometimes yeah. and depending on like if you put you know, like honey with it and other like toppings and accoutrements um can definitely make a difference i've done like a brie that's been wrapped in prosciutto which makes it more salty and savory or if you drizzle it with honey it'll make it a little sweeter um when you bake it it'll bring some of those flavors forward um so but i'm personally a fan of brie anyway especially with apple randomly um i like the tartness and the creaminess together really well so with brie i've always had these discussions with friends and and and, it's, and it sometimes becomes a uh, an intense conversation because like okay do you eat the brie all of it or do you not eat the rind so it's always the question of oh. rind or no rind it's kind of like eat the rind the rind <laughs> brie is totally edible um the only ones that really aren't edible are the wax ones um, yeah. but for the most part, I'm all about eating the rind. Most people avoid it. They'll dig around it, but then I'm like, well, more for me. Yeah. Which, which is a lot of work. I've tried to do it once. I'm like, this is like miserable. <laughs> right. <laughs> like eat the whole thing. Just eat it. <laughs> Put it with something else and you're good to go. <laughs> Very, nice. Very nice. Um, and I, 
I'm one of those people that always tries to avoid the rind, but now I'm thinking I have to try to taste it after after what Stephanie said. I got to give it a shot. So it, it does give you know. a different experience as well. I mean, if you separate them, it's different. But I think when you mix the two together, you get that creaminess. Then you get a little bit of 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 kind of a, I guess a, maybe a dustiness. I don't know how else to categorize it in a way, but but it blends well. It really does. Yeah. yeah. I want to recognize a couple more people that, uh, that I see are watching. Uh, my niece in Silver Spring is on, as well as uh, my old friend Marty is in Rochester, New York, watching us. So it's great. We've got people in New York watching tonight. That's really cool. And uh, and Lake Linganore is in the house as well. Hi, Kevin. So that's, that's awesome. Um, before we go any further, I think we'll take a quick break and drink the uh, drink our Prosecco's while Stephanie is going to teach us a little bit about making a charcuterie board. So Stephanie, we're going to get to drink and you get to work now. Thanks yeah. so much. So you ask me questions as we go, but so I'm going to tilt my laptop down so that you guys can see the board and I'm going to try building the board facing. Um, so we'll start Let me pull this in front and let me know if you guys can see that. Okay. That you see that? Yes. Okay, perfect. So perfect. since we're making a board for two, this will probably be a little bit bigger, but like I really could eat this board myself if I wanted. Um, <laughs> if we're being completely honest. Um, so you'll see I've already put a couple of things on to make it Valentine's Day. So I have my little heart ramekins, I think are always so fun to have. And then you're gonna see that I have this little salami flour. Um, so I'm going to take part of the salami flour out and just give a brief show of how to do it, where you take, we'll just take some of the middle out, just so it was, and you actually will take your salami in a regular like whole piece. You're going to fold it in half, not always fully up to the edge, if you see, and you're going to stack and layer, and then you're just going to roll. And so theoretically with a whole salami rows, you're going to do the whole thing and you'll roll it all together and then place it in and kind of fluff it is. So that'll just kind of figure that would be easy to do in advance so that you guys could see the little trick and then go from there. So, so from there, I like to generally place my bigger items first. So starting with like ramekins and cheese are usually my main two. So I'm going to go ahead. I have this. Um, it is a sour cherry ginger um, jam from Trade Street Jam Company based out of New York, which is delicious. Um, so we just kind of put that in here. And these little servings are like perfect for the little ramekins. So get that guy going here and then pull over the really good stuff. The cheeses. So as you can see, I have some aged cheddar on this board, some goat cheese, and then some manchego. So obviously we'll be pairing these with our reds when we get there. Um, so we'll start by placing some of the bigger items first. I'm just thinking goat cheese will go here. And then aged cheddar tends to not slice very easily, but more crumbles. So you can break it by hand or if you wanna use part of like your knife, you can kind of just like break and pull and twist and kind of gives you, and they're very easy to then just like grab and snack on. So that there. And so then I also have some manchego. So I did the alternating route. Um, and so instead of laying them all flat together and fan them, I actually alternated the pieces so that easy to kind of grab and go. And so we'll kind of tilt these back here and tuck those for easy grabbing. Then from there, I'm a prosciutto fan for sure. I don't know about everybody else, but prosciutto is, can be kind of difficult to play with, but you just kind of grab it tuck it up and then we'll tuck it across 
from the salami. So your concept for a board is usually about spreading color and taste across the whole board. So I just grabbed two pieces since we're trying to stick to the idea of doing a board for two. And so you can kind of see we have a color scheme going on as well. Um, so for Valentine's Day, sticking with the reds, the pinks, and all of that. Um, so I have some strawberries that we'll also kind of sprinkle throughout the board. Here. Now, is there anything that you guys, Alan and Peter, like to have on your charcuterie boards when you're eating? These? Or are you a fan of it all? I'm definitely a fan of it all. And uh, this looks delicious. Yeah. You know, um, something that Jess asked earlier, and I, and, I, and I forgot to mention, but I think it's a really good question looking at the charcuterie board. And, and Peter, you can chime in on this as well. Yes. With, um, with the sparkling wines, do, do certain foods uh, cause the uh, drier or sweeter sensation in sparkling wine? I say yes, because I've had that 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 experience. It's it, it, it's almost as uh, and and kind of I think why you know it's 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 an aperitif because it like almost preps your mouth, you, you know the bubbles and everything. It, it, it kind of like enhances it or stimulates them to where as soon as you have something, it, it, you pick up on certain flavors. I think a little quicker on on that aspect because I've 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 had that experience where. It, it, depending on the cheese or, or, or fruit wise. And, and that's something that, that, that I see and that like my sister does it all the time is, you know, anytime there's jazz Prosecco or something sparkling, she has to put some piece of fruit in it uh, to have it. It's usually a raspberry or a grape or something. That's where she's like, yeah, cause then by the end I'm done, it's like, uh, I have a grape and they taste well beyond and better than I normally have them. So, so I agree with you. It, it, it is an enhancer. Uh, oh by God. all means, uh, I think more than when you, when we look at red wine or everything of how it, more of a pair or something that complements it. I, I agree that this that the sparkling enhances it. Oh, for sure, totally agree. Stephanie I, uh, Rick Stoltz is asking, "What is your method when it comes to building a board? Colors, symmetry?" Yes, so definitely trying to do symmetry across. So as you can see, as we were talking, kind of placing, keeping balance across the board. Um, I tend to, you know, like I was saying, place the cheeses and the ramekins first because those are like your bigger items and then your smaller ones you can kind of sprinkle around. Um, and then keeping color across and not trying to like overthink it, which I have been guilty of in the past. Um, and as you can see, I like to load a board and cover all the spaces, which you don't have to do, but I highly recommend because you get more good stuff out of it. Um, is kind of my general method for the madness, if you will, um, for board building. But I like doing the big pieces first and then kind of going down into the smaller ones. So, so as you can see, we have most of the board filled. Um, I did grab, I do like to put a little bit of sweetness on the board from time to time. So I just grabbed some Hershey Kisses for Valentine's <laughs> Day. So you can just Never go wrong with chocolate. <laughs> no, chocolate is another fun one to pair, right? I don't yes, do it as absolutely. often. Now, do you have, Peter, a, a chocolate like preference with wine? I always well, struggle with chocolate in particular. It's so it, it it's described that like seventy two percent is the ideal chocolate because of. Um, it's not too bitter, not too sweet. So it, it kind of defines maybe what, what chocolate is. So so I've, it, it's kind of like graduating with wine, you know, sometimes the, the first wines you have uh, as, as you're, uh, you know, introducing yourself to wine, you know, maybe okay, but, and it's same with chocolate. So I tend to find, uh, my palate's kind of adapted to finding that's that's got a little more darkness to it. And, right. and so, so I tend to like them when they're where, um, you know, anything over 60 percent, 72, you know, if, if you have something sweet, uh, it, you can do something. Uh, I think if you start hitting the 80 percent range, uh, it, you'll kind of have a nice pairing to it because it'll, it'll, it'll enhance and bring some sweetness into it uh, in, in that case. But 
And that's kind of where, where I tend to fall on, on, on my chocolate and, and, and yeah. pairing wise as well. But red wine, I think for sure, and sparkling tend to be my two go-tos if it's if I'm pairing chocolate or having chocolate. Definitely. Stephanie, we're getting lots of wonderful comments about your board. Um, right. What was the last item you put on there? So these are little fig crackers from good old Trader Joe's. I like putting a little, the last step is usually, or one of the last steps is a little bit of crunch on your board. So, and the really cherry. Um, so crackers, I like the grain crackers in particular. I think it really adds a nice texture to the board and for fun flavors amongst all the cheeses is usually one of my go-tos. And these are one of my personal faves from Trader Joe's um, as well. And then, yeah. And so then our last step is to put the finishing touches on is to garnish. So I can do a lot of different things, but rosemary is one of my go-tos and as well as thyme and sage. So then you kind of just like add it and tuck it around and then we will finish this one off. So I grabbed, and the nice thing is like, I have a rosemary plant that I have out on my patio. Um, I'm surprised so I should probably bring it in now. Probably the one herb that I could grow the best because- Rosemary? Yeah, because it doesn't freeze. You maybe don't take care of it that well sometimes. Right. Like I think <laughs> it's always it there. Exactly. I last time it was not cold and it did just fine. So I'm thinking I'm following that same method this year. And then, all right. And so with our little garnish, we have our Valentine's Day themed charcuterie board. That is amazing. I can't so. believe how quickly you did that. <laughs> I, well, to be honest, I did think about it a little bit because I was like, I don't have as much time to just like sit and stare at it. So I did have a game plan to be completely honest, but there we go. Well, I, mean, I think it would have took me about two or three hours to do what you just did. <laughs> think I've had a lot of practice, but. Last night did not look anything like that. <laughs> but it We're has close. a Valentine's Day theme. I could eat it all myself. I will share it. All the good stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank it was you. Really, really cool. Absolutely. And now I have dinner. So this was multi Okay. It's absolutely. Oh, I, so Stephanie, there's another question I want. Uh, I'm, I'm not asking. Rick Stoltz is asking. Uh, he says, "What cheeses do you like for a big crowd? Any suggestions for amount when it, uh, the amount when it comes to people?" So. For, type, for crowd pleasing cheese, I always like, I generally like to stick to three cheeses on a board, um, unless you're gonna have like a massive crowd, but usually two crowd pleasers. You can never go wrong with like a, generally a cheddar, a soft cheese of some sort. And then you can go a little bit more like out there of different ones, like blue cheese. It's a hit or miss with people. Some people love blue cheese and some people are like, don't get that near me. Um, so I think you yeah, third. So good with the, I think that pairs well with prosecco as well. I it, agree. I really consider getting blue cheese really today. Tasted. Yeah, um, and especially like a Stilton would just be yeah. delicious. Um, I think is a good kind of rule of thumb. And then for the amount of cheeses, I definitely don't follow this like rule hardcore. Um, but if it's like a full dinner, you can look at doing like four ounces of cheese or if it's per cheese that you're putting on a board, or if you're doing it as an appetizer, I would recommend like two, which basically comes out to be, I think it's like four, like it's dice cubes pretty much per cheese. I definitely break that rule all the time though. Um, <laughs> like I said, I could eat this whole thing, so. So That's Jesse really Alvarado hard. said that he loves the, uh, the herbs decorating the idea. Uh, the I, herbs I, are fun. Well, Jesse said it a lot better than I did, but I'm sure you can see it. Oh, yeah. I think it adds like a nice touch to the board to finish it. And then it looks like a little dressed up, if you will, for the occasion. So That's wonderful. So the next wine we're going to taste tonight is the Amori Red Blend. And uh, this was the recommended red last year from the Washington Post for Valentine's Day. So I hope everyone appreciates it. And Peter, if you want to tell us a little bit about it. 
Absolutely. Well, besides the fact that it's got a a heart on it, which would only mean it's natural and fit for uh, Valentine's Day. And then, of course, using the word amore. Um, this is actually one of the other ones that were some of my early samples I got to try with this. So with this winery, besides the Massatina, uh, Antiche Terre, uh, which is who produces this wine. And so the winery is located in, in Verona, uh, which, is, which is very close to uh, where the wines, uh, you know, in that same region where we had the Proseccos. Um, <clears throat> and, and this particular winery, so you kind of look, you see it on the map. So we're, we're all in this top right uh, column there where you see Veneto and uh, Trentino and, and those areas, kind of the green and yellowish areas. And, uh, is is where we located, and so uh, so the grapes, of course. I mean, the reds there, especially. I mean, they're uh, they're going to be lighter, but even in generally, I think with Italian, I mean, it's had a very marine history. So w most of the wines are are come from a more lighter style. It's it's things that pair well with 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 fish uh, and and lighter foods as that, and that that seems to be the unifying theme just over the course of time of all the years of winemaking. Is, is is what you get and so but this was actually a, a the winery started in the early 1900s and it was a a a, a kind of a, a partnership that was 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 a that started this winery it was two gentlemen that that basically had a passion for wine uh you know one really either enjoyed the growing and things of that sort the other gentleman likes the wine making and and so they've been making wine in this region now you know over 100 years so, and still the same family owned. And, and, and as you kind of see uh, between the, the, the first two and, and generally with the Kovali brands, kind of what we do is we tend to partner with family wineries, you know, that, that we tend to look for on those as well. But, so this is a nice red blend. Uh, again, if, if you're seeing it, it's, it's, it's got a, a consistently great rating. And so the grapes that uh, come with this wine, so it's a blend of, of three, three different grapes. So it's it's 40% Corvina, which is something that's grown in that area. It's also, uh, uh, it is the name of a, a fish as well. Uh, and many times I'm sure you may have had Corvina at, if you've gone out, um, which is again a light fish. But so so primarily it's it's Corvina grape. Uh, then it's Merlot, which will be the other 30%. And then the other 30% is Syrah. Uh, but, and, and, you know, so the Corvina is, it's it's near where you find it with with what Merlot in, in its body and its characteristic. It's not going to have a lot of tannins. This wine, so it, it's it, it's a great pair with a lot of different things, including fish, including Corvina, and uh, but the the Syrah is, is 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 always known for its like black pepper characteristic, and and so that's why I've loved this wine is. Is is it's nice and round, lots of not lots of flavor. It gets a little of that pepperiness uh, that that you can kind of you know pair it with some some even some spicy foods. It'll kind of bring that out. And but but again, it's very easy drinking and and it's and especially for for individuals that you know might be hesitant in trying red wines. Uh, it's kind of a good good balance. If maybe they're a Pinot Noir drinker, this is a good next upgrade to get a chance to to step up to another level. Uh, in that case. So uh, it, it definitely, definitely a recommendation. It would pair well with, 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 of course, I know the, the any of that uh, charcuterie board that you presented uh, in that aspect and, and all the fruits itself, but, but you will also be able to do some grilled meats with that. Cause again, anything that has some spice or behind spice it, it, that Syrah will really complement that well. Thanks Peter. Um, Stephanie, before I ask you what pairs best on your board with the uh, Amore, I, I wanted to mention uh, Susan Wilson said, beautiful board. Thanks for the ideas. Love adding the, adding the savory aromatics. Absolutely. And uh, Trilor Price had a question. She wanted to know, do you have a suggestion for a wine meat pairing to go with pecoroni cheese? I'm probably torturing that name. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Peter, you may have some for like meat recommendations and wine. I'm trying to think. It's been a while since I've had Pecorino. Um, the, 
Yeah, I, I do, but I was, it, uh, but for some reason, the first thing that came to mind was it was right before the Super Bowl. There was a pairing that was published on what, like, I don't know, call it junk food, I guess, or not. But, and I was, and so I was sitting here thinking, I'm like, this would really pair well with some Frito Lays or something of that sort. Well, Frito, yeah. <laughs> it was all about well, what would you pair it with between candy, chips, and things of that sort, but I was like, you know, I, I, that's maybe where I would go with this particular aspect if you right. wanted to go off the wall. But, um, but, but as far as it, you know, because of how this wine is, it's it's right in the middle of the road. You get the body of of what you get out of a Merlot. You get a lot of fruit characteristic. You get the spiciness of the Syrah. Uh, it, the, I can't think of one that it wouldn't pair with. So right. there's it. it if if you like it, if you like this cheese, I, I think there's. I'm. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, there's yeah. really no other one that, I, uh, that would not be perfect with this. Yeah, and the nice thing about like this particular wine is it is it's right in that middle road because I always yeah. find red wine is a little bit more challenging to pair with cheeses, especially, and aged cheeses usually are like better with red wine, but for the most part, it can be a little like food pairings red. Definitely, there's tons of options. Cheese is a little bit harder from time to time unless you're going on the lighter yeah. side. And this one I feel like falls right into that camp. Like aged cheddar, sure. which is what we have on the board is what like I would initially think. Um, not like a super aged cheddar, but definitely in that like getting a little bit more mature would work really well. Um, which I'm definitely a fan. I, I tend to like cheeses that are more mature or or right. the sharper the better in right. a way. I love like an aged Gouda in particular that just is like salty and nutty and has like those salt crystals in it. And I yes. think it goes really well with a really big, bold red um, is one of my like ones that I gravitate towards for sure. Um, but with this, definitely like a cheddar, I think works really well or like a slightly aged Gouda. Yes, I, I would. I, I see something because, you know, grilled meats was something that 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 specifies that is a good pairing. So I think anything that has a smoked characteristic to it will, will mm, work well. Yeah. Any smoked like, cheese, I think. Cheeses would be, would be delicious. Susan Wilson, even uh, I mean, that would work too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, pimento. So Susan Wilson, you know. She went ahead and recommended uh, smoked mushrooms and spicy Selton. Which I'm probably pronouncing Ooh. that correctly too. I haven't I think, had mushrooms. I think that's a great idea. Spice the mushrooms. Yeah. That is awesome. Doing some stuffed mushrooms would be. Mm. Now I'm really getting hungry. Yeah. Um, so. It, I'm seeing the question of what what the uh, what what my 2021 go to red is has been in, and it, it it this year what I've what I found myself going to is is reds that are are, are not the traditional varietals is where I've been more experimenting or wines that you know may have traditionally been uh, for example like Corvina or things where it's a blended blended type or 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 or, or a grape that you tend to find in a blend, but never on its own, is tends to be where like Bonarda or, or, or some mm -hmm. things of that sort of tends to be. And because they're kind of unique, they have, you know, when they're on their own, they, they really serve, uh, you know, Cap Franc, I, I think it's kind of been my new find. I've been loving uh, Cap Franc lately. It is yeah, it's, it's, it, it. yeah, it's, it's, it's got that perfect, you get the, you get some tannins to it, but not necessarily as much as, as you might in the Cap Sauve, but you get a little more body out of it. So, and and Cap Franc tends to even grow well in different parts of the United States. So, especially up in New York and the Finger Lakes, and and even in Virginia, it's it's a grape that 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 tends to blend itself well. Whereas something like Pinot or some others, it's it, it's you could see a dif difference between where it's from. Oh, so. for sure. Peter, you mentioned the Finger Lakes and the uh, Cap Franc. And back uh, when we did our Thanksgiving wines on Virtual Vino, we had the Cuca Lake Vineyards Cabernet Franc. Yes. Which is um, unbelievable wine. I mean, just incredible. That's probably the one, uh, it was uh, eight years ago, I went out there to to see it. And that was the, we took a little tour. They put you on this little van and you and you, and you go around and visit. Uh, and, and at first I was like, oh, we could just do it ourselves. But thank, it, it, the best idea ever is to get someone else to drive you. And they give you these glasses, and they're like, "We stop by," but that was it. Is is is, and that's where I really had a chance to experience Cap Franc, you know, outside of of maybe a, a French uh, or or California, some of that sort. And 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 uh, it just was too short of a trip, unfortunately, because just sitting there looking at the lake and having 
So Cat Frog was was fantastic. Oh yeah. yeah the thing that you do a block yeah. tasting and you, you, you would, no one would guess that. Oh, this is definitely New York. So Stephanie, your go-to cheese for 2021. Ooh, there's so many, it's hard to pick, but um, aged Gouda for sure. I've just been on like an aged Gouda kick for sure, as well as, um, let's see. I don't know, I do really like blue cheese. Now that we've started talking about it, I, it's not one I have as often as I should, just because I love it, but not everybody does. So I think more blue cheese is probably in my future for 2021. Great. Okay, so our last wine tonight is the Guru Gold. And uh, anybody that's followed Virtual Vino knows that we taste a lot of the uh, Guru wines. And uh, we've had Yana from Ego Bodegas on occasionally to tell us about her winery and such. And she's a wonderful, wonderful guest. Um, so I hope everyone enjoys the Guru Gold. Yeah, this definitely has been... It was it was it was a winery like hey this is the first one I need to know and I and I think the the story behind uh, of how they got started is 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 just kind of unique the way again they look at it and so I mean relatively uh, young when it comes to winemaking so it really isn't about uh, well you, you, which you might think okay it's 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 about the name of the place or it's got a historic name or or anything of that sort it's it's a winery that's all about, well, we're, we're going to take what, what we, you know, the great area of, of Humia itself and produce some wines that, you know, have a modern, uh, maybe modern flair uh, to it as well to be a little different in this case. And so uh, of, of their wines, the, the, the Goru Red Blend was, 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 has definitely been one of my favorites. And, and so when we launched uh, the Goru Gold, and and especially the rating that it's received, it's been it's been quite a quite a unique uh, uh, experience. And I think this 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 just takes that brand and and uh, accelerates it from that aspect itself. So uh, and and that's another you know going back to when we were talking about another you know Monastrel, uh, which is which is primarily what the, what they grow in in Humia is it's kind of one of those because. Uh, Mouvedra is what they call it in France, and but again, you don't normally, you know, that, that wouldn't be something you'd think about picking up. You're like, hey, I want a uh, a, a Mouvedra or something of that sort. But so this is another grape uh, to go back to. Uh, Rick, who asked what it is that, that that I like is 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 this has been why I've kind of been liking this wine because it's all about that monastrel and mm -hmm. the blends. And you kind of if you see on the map, you'll see where the Humilia region is, and so. Uh, so this particular one is is going to be a blend. So it's got the monastrel, just primarily the content to it. So, uh, which, which which again, it, it's a it's a grape that's got a lot of flavor, good color, uh, not too high on tannins, uh, but it's it's blended with some cabernet and and syrah. So they also uh, age this wine twelve months uh, on uh, French, a mix of both French and American oak. And, and so you'll really see the difference. It's got slightly different percentages of what the Goru, some of the other Goru has, but you know, again, always harvested by hand. And that's the other thing this winery is, it's, it, it's vegan. So, so they really put some practices into play and we'll have some videos that we're gonna show here in a little bit that you'll, you'll get a chance to see uh, pictures of the winery itself and some of the bottling lines and things of that sort. So again, it was all about being modern utilizing practices that that allow the winery to 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 be efficient and and again uh kind of sustainable and, and proper to the environment uh but then also uh, come up with some blends that would not normally you know be uh traditional i guess in that sense and be a little different than than just thinking of okay you know rioja when you go to the spanish you know wines you think of certain wines and so this kind of gets a chance to break that mold a little bit so so I really encourage everyone to try it. I mean, they got a 93 from uh, Wine Spectator. So I, I think you'll get a chance to see this. And, and this is a great video to take a look at what, what you'll have. But that's the first thing I'm going to do is, is pour myself a glass. And I recommend everyone do it the same. And, and I think it's one of those wines that takes two, two sips to really experience it. And, 
And uh, it's it, 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 you, you really get that characteristic of the monastery. You get that spice. You get the fruit. The cab's going to give it more of intense tannins, but it's going to have a nice, beautiful color. So here, this is again, you know, built from the ground up, this whole entire winery, they, they started, so found the land and said, this is where we're going to put it. And we'll have Yana on, uh, Jess, you probably could put it up there because I can't remember the date, but we'll have Yana on in the next month or two again. And she's just, she does a great job of telling us the history and explaining a lot about the vineyard. The uh, Guru Gold is actually the largest purchase DMV ever made of a single product. We brought in a large container of Guru Gold as soon as it was available. It's, it's just an amazing wine. You know, I think, and, 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 uh, you know, with uh, Ioana is, you know, her, you know, she's Romanian uh, as, so, so I think that's what kind of brings a different, you know, he's a, uh, you know, Santos is is of Spanish origin, but I think that's kind of what makes that pairing nice. Is is he brings some in. Romania is another great wine growing region uh, as as well. And I think that's, that's you know they're kind of how they decided that this is what we're going to do. We're going to build the winery from scratch. And if I, I think it was 2011 when when that that was done, and so it's it's really amazing what they've been able to do and, and kind of uh, take a different perspective and a unique perspective on that. Oh yeah, in such a right. short amount of time, it's it's absolutely incredible the success they've had. The uh, Guru Verde, which we had on two weeks ago, um, that was the number one great value of 2017, according to the Washington Post. So it's not just Guru Gold that's wonderful, they make lots of great wines. I showed a picture of the Fuerza earlier, which is also delicious. So Stephanie, now that yeah. you've had a chance to taste the Guru Gold. I know it's delicious. It mm -hmm. breathes a little bit, it opens up a little bit more as, as it sits in the glass yes. and you kind of swirl it, for sure. Um, but yeah, so I would totally, I actually picked up some Manchego for this one. Um, has a little bit more, it's a stronger flavor. I feel like has a little bit of that gaminess to it that pairs really nicely with a more a bolder red wine. I kind of always feel like as your wines get bolder, your cheeses sometimes need to go in that direction too. Um, so Manchego was kind of the pick for this one today. And I always kind of like the tip that I've learned over the years of what, what grows together goes together. So when a wine or a grape from a certain region, kind of think of like where the food and the cheeses and all of that sort of come from. Is it also a good little like kind of tip to keep in mind when you're shopping for both wine and cheese. Which the first time I had Manchego was at a wine tasting when I got into the wine uh -huh. business. Prior to that, I was like, I had no idea what it was. And yeah. somebody put it out there and I'm like, okay. But it's it's another one of those. So so I usually seek it out when when it's available or I ask what is on a charcuterie board and they're like, and I hear Manchego, I'm like, perfect. Because like, <laughs> yeah. never get tired of it. Cause it is, it's got that nice mildness. It's, it's, it's got some, it, it, but at the same time, it's, it's very lack of a better term. I mean, some, uh, of, of, of strength, I guess, you know, it's, it's really good. Yeah. It's got a strong like flavor to it and the texture yeah. of it. I think also like it's, it has a stronger texture that works really nicely with a red wine in particular. That's a little bit more bold. Um, so, and this is one that does have a wax seal that you don't want to eat the rind. On no, the it is. That, that is correct. It doesn't taste that good. <laughs> no, it doesn't taste that good. I have tasted it before and that was a bad choice. Well, that's the problem is, is, is you get these cheeses and it's not that there's really an instruction sheet. And and so I'm like, well, I'm either going to, you, know, you ask the question, like, do you eat this? They're, everyone's like, I don't know. So you're like, you try it. I'm like, no, nah, okay. Clearly not. Yeah. 
So, Stephanie, uh, Abby Dissinger is putting you on the spot. She wants Ooh. to know which of tonight's wines would you say goes best with your board? Ooh. I would probably, honestly, I from my earlier talking about how, like, bubbles goes with almost anything, I would pick one of the Proseccos, um, I think, is a good match because I kind of feel like this one would struggle a little bit with the goat cheese just because of the creaminess. Would It would just kind of um, not go as well together. So I would kind of lean towards the Proseccos. I, I'm going in that camp. I agree. I mean, I think it would have to be sparkling because the sparkling definitely pairs pairs with everything. Right. As we discussed earlier today, um, sparkling really does. You can't go wrong with sparkling. So. I, know. I need to do the sparkling with like the fried chicken. Like that's been a new trend that everyone's been talking about that I'm like, I need to try. Yes. But then you'd have to add waffles to that. Ooh, yeah. See? Okay. Chicken waffles and some Prosecco, I think, would be yes. a good thing. I'm going to add that to the menu. Let's <laughs> see. It happen soon. So, we got to taste everything. We had a lot of great comments and questions. I want to thank everyone for joining us and obviously thank Stephanie and Peter for all of their input. And this was really cool. I, Having the charcuterie board was really added a lot, Stephanie. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And, and, and Peter, all of your information was wonderful. It, it's nice to be able to sit back and let everyone else do the work. It's, it's really a, a nice position to be in. So I thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. And uh, stick around in the green room so I can say, say hi later on. Sounds great. Perfect. Thank you very much. This was a lot of fun. So Peter was saying happy Valentine's Day, which I should have said earlier. Um, thanks again to both Peter and Stephanie. And uh, hopefully uh, everyone can join us again in two weeks. We're going to have our Portuguese wine tasting in two weeks. And uh, you can see the list of the wines up there on the screen. If your store near you does not carry the wines, please Facebook message us and, and we will help you find a location in your area. If you live outside the DMV, like our friend Marty, you can always order the wines from Paul's at Chevy Chase. Thanks again so much to everyone for joining us tonight. I hope you enjoyed the show and I hope to see you again in two weeks. Thank you. Happy Valentine's Day.